My name is Kavitha Bindra. I'm the Managing Director for Alumni Relations at the Yale School of Management and a member of the class of 2005. Um, we're really grateful that you're uh, joining us today for uh, this terrific uh, webinar on big data. And uh, I'd like to just uh, first introduce our uh, panelists, our guests today. Um, I'll just uh, introduce them and then uh, go th start with a couple of questions. They're going to be talking back and forth with each other about uh, some of the questions that I ask. Um, so it'll be fairly conversational. Um, we're hoping uh, that the attendees will also submit questions. You can do that through the chat function on Zoom. Uh, so please submit your questions and we will uh, share those uh, with our guests as well and they can uh, respond. Um, that'll be about 30 or 40 minutes into the discussion. So I'm going to start with uh, Professor uh, Nicholas Christakis. He's a Saul Goldman Family Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale University. Uh, he's a sociologist and physician who conducts research in the areas of social networks and biological si biosocial science, excuse me. He directs the Human Nature Lab. His current research is mainly focused on two topics. One, the social, mathematical, and biological rules governing how social networks form. And two, the social and biological implications of how they operate to influence thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. His lab uses both observational and experimental methods to study these phenomena, exploiting techniques from sociology, computer science, biosocial science, demography, statistics, behavioral gen genetics, evolutionary biology, epi epi epidemiology, and other fields. He's the author of several books and over 150 articles and was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2006 and was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2010. So thank you, Professor Christakis. Thank you for having me. Um, we also have Megan Eisenberg from uh, SOM class of 2004, so we overlap by one year. Um, Megan is the CMO of MongoDB. She spent over 20 years working in the high-tech industry. She was one of the top 50 most retweeted by mid-sized marketers, according to Adweek study, and 2015, uh, in 2015, and the most influential MarTech leaders, and one of the top 25 B2B marketing influencers, according to Inside View. Before joining MongoDB, she was, excuse me, VP of Demand Generation and Customer Marketing at DocuSign. Uh, she has a Master of Business Administration with a focus on marketing and strategy from Yale School of Management and a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, MIS with a minor in CSC from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Thank you, Megan, for joining us as well. Thanks for having me. And uh, last but not least, we have Harlan Crumholz joining us. Uh, he is a cardiologist, healthcare scientist, and healthcare improvement expert at Yale University, where he is a Harold H. Hines Jr. Professor of Medicine and co-director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program. He's a director of the Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation at Yale New Haven Health. He has led research and initiatives to improve the quality and outcomes of clinical decisions and healthcare delivery reduce disparities, enable transparency in practice and research, and avoid wasteful practices. His team is guiding federal efforts to measure and promote healthcare value. Dr. Krumholz established the Yale Open Data Access Project to promote data sharing and open science. He founded the Yale Core Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, aimed to deliver novel methodolog methodological approaches and tools to generate meaningful knowledge from large complex healthcare data collections. He's also a scientific director of large scale population based and clinical projects in China with the National Center for Cardiovascular Diseases, including the Million Persons Project, a precision medicine initiative. He founded Hugo, a mobile app to empower people with their health related data, promoting the possibility of a consumer mediated information platform. 
He is a founding member of the Board of Governors, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, and the Association of American Physicians. Dr. Krumholz received a BS from Yale, an MD from Harvard Medical School, and a master's in health policy and management from the Harvard University School of Public Health. So thank you, Dr. Krumholz, for joining us as well. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be on with Nicholas and Megan, and I'm a big fan of MongoDB, so special, special privilege to be on with her. Great. Thank you. So I'm just going to start with um, a sort of big question, and that is, how do you define big data, and how do you apply it day to day in what you do? Sure. So happy to kick that off. Uh, as you know, when I think about big data, it refers to technologies and initiatives that involve data that's too diverse, fast changing, or massive for conventional technologies and skills. And what I mean by that is, there's today, as we know, there's so much, there's large volumes of data, the velocity is moving fast, and the variety. And in fact, industry analysts think it's anywhere from 44 to 400 zettabytes of data out there. And to put that in perspective, uh, a Boeing 787 in an hour of flight throws off 40 terabytes of data. So there's just so much out there that we can collect and look at. And so it's not really a single technology. It's not a technique initiative. It's rather um, a practice applied across our different fields. And so whether you're in retail or you're in tech, trying to do some predictive stuff with customer experience, or you're in um, healthcare doing some interesting things, it's a way to access that data and make sense of it. I mean, I would add to that, I suppose that, uh, I mean, many people would think of big data primarily, literally in terms of the size. So until the internet sort of revolution in the last 20 years, most data sets, whether arrived from hospitals or de novo surveys, you know, had a few hundred or a few thousand subjects um, and then had a few hundred variables and uh, maybe had one or two or three time points. But along all of those axes, because of the massive passive data collection that's possible in so many industries, those are all exploding. So you might have observations on millions or billions of people and you might have thousands of variables or information about each individual and you might have them at levels of temporal resolution that are just mind-boggling, literally to the second sometimes, for example, in, in phone data. So it, it's big in that way, but there's some other features that big data has that I think are worth, worth emphasizing. One is that typically they are obtained naturalistically. That is to say, people are going about their business or machines are, have, are doing whatever they're doing, you know, planes are flying, um, and the data are passively collected. So, so they don't have the same observer effect. You know, the, the data can be collected without a scientist or a policymaker or, or a business person intervening in the system or saying, I'm collecting data now. They just are passively uh, collected. And the third feature I would emphasize as well is that I think these advances in big data technology give us new opportunities to conduct experiments. And um, they do this in part because they've driven down the cost of the experiment. So, so people always, you know, would do sort of A-B testing. You know, a marketer might do a marketing study. They might have three or four focus groups, or they might have some outlets have this type of advertising and other outlets have that type of advertising, or a clinical uh, trialist, uh, you know, might be interested in uh, following up uh, some kind of medication that had been used and might have a sample of patients in one region. But now, actually, we can do these experiments on a much larger scale, and I'm sure most of the listeners are familiar with these ideas of A-B testing that so many companies do, but the capacity to do this kind of A-B testing has been greatly facilitated by the emergence and existence of a broad set of ideas that I would put under the umbrella of big data. Great. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just weigh in here a minute. That, so first of all, big data, of course, does re re refer in a way to the size and 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 the velocity and the you know all the kinds of things that we talk about around the fact that there are immense amounts of data. But I, I think what's more interesting is to think about its cultural impact. So it, it's as if someone is now invented the microscope for our era. There was a lot of information <clears throat> that was that we could learn from that was out of our grasp before the digital revolution. 
before the conversion of a lot of interactions that were really beyond our reach, our inability to see, collect, analyze, understand, we were left with other methods of trying to understand the world, trying to respond to the world, trying to create systems that could be responsive and improve the world. And, and with this revolution that's occurred just really in relatively small amount of time, our capacity to be able to call that information and use it in ways that generates new knowledge and new knowledge that can be applied and in the application of that knowledge, generate even more knowledge and iteratively improve and learn in, in the ways that Nicholas is alluding to is, um, would have been incomprehensible even 20 years ago. And I think that, that this notion of big data is around a, a, a re-engineering of the way that we learn about our world and the way in which we can apply those learnings to, to practice. And that's required a lot of new tools. I mean, the interesting thing about MongoDB is that it's, it, it, it's giving us the capacity to be able to use tools that we never, never really even needed before. And it's sort of conventional uh, relational database architectures were fine for really relatively meager amounts of data, but that the new age of data is, is forcing us to both embrace new tools and new skills in order to fully leverage this. So when people say big data is going to solve all these problems, what it's done is create opportunities. And the question is going to be for us, and, and I'm from the world of medicine, and we have been so slow in responding to this opportunity, but, but we're starting to wake up. And the question will be, can we seize this opportunity? Big data will not solve a single problem for us. It will create immense opportunities for us. And the question will be, will we ask the right questions? Will we embrace the right tools? Will we be able to produce knowledge that we can then apply, test, determine whether it's made things better and continue an upward, uh, an upward spiral of uh, ever better application of what we're learning? And so um, I, I think this idea of big data is about the it is about the brute force number amount of data, but it's it's more than that. It's about whether or not we're about to enter an entirely new age of discovery that's tightly linked to application, that's leveraging what goes on in the real world and is integrated into, as Nicholas says, a whole series of ways to be able to test whether or not our theories are right and whether we can make the world better as a result. Yeah, there's a really good example. The city of Chicago, uh, they're, they're collecting uh, through all these sensors throughout the city um, information. They call, their project's called Windy Grid, and they monitor um, what, you know, things like um, number of 911 calls, complaints, broken lights, liquor permits, abandoned buildings, and, and they do this through 30 different departments. And I analyzing geospatial data in real time, and they're using it to cut crime and improve municipal services in real time. And they're starting to predict where crime is growing, where they need to shift services, how to address everything, and um, it's amazing. And they've open sourced it to all cities, any city that wants to uh, use it and, and implement it, and it's cool the way they're trying to address crime in that city. Great. Uh, thank you. And I, I just wanted to know, we've had a couple of questions. Um, uh, Dr. Krumholz uh, doesn't have access to video at this time, and that's why his screen appears as, as it does. So just wanted, wanted to note that quickly. Um, another question about, um, I think you've all talked about the potential um, applications uh, for big data. And there is a lot of talk about um, sort of, I, I, I don't want to call it hype, but there's a lot of talk about it in both the popular press and the specialized press. Um, and I, I just wanted to hear from each of you um, whether you think it is uh, more than hype or whether um, big data is uh, truly transformational in your fields. And are, are you seeing those really transformational opportunities now? Well, I think picking up on what uh, Harlan said earlier, this sort of microscope, or I would even say a telescope analogy, you know, before uh, before Galileo reads about the invention of a telescope described in the Netherlands, everyone knew there were stars in the heavens. We knew about the planets. But uh, Galileo builds his first telescope, and he just starts looking, you know, up in the heavens. And he sees sunspots, and he sees ridges on the moon, and he sees moons orbiting Jupiter, which 
which itself totally overthrows the kind of geocentric theory of the solar system because you know it was inconceivable that things would rotate around other bodies. So the, this discovery of this 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 instrument uh, opened up new understandings in astronomy, and I think actually that's sort of what's happening now with the big data, at least in the social sciences, and I would say in the medical sciences, two areas that I know more. I think I think we have uh, new tools. I think we have uh, new data that are obliging us to ask new questions and revisit old questions in new ways. I think they are driving the invention of new methods. So you have statisticians uh, who are kind of been, you know, just phenomenally excited about how are we going to invent techniques to make causal inferences based on observational data, computer scientists that are inventing new ways to cope with these vast amounts of data, to visualize them, to filter them, to process them, to extract insights. So I think it is different. I don't think it's hype. And I think all of these three things, data, methods, and ideas, are creating a perfect storm for discovery that I think will be useful for firms, uh, certainly in marketing and in business performance, but also for some of the kind of pro bono publico ideas that Megan just mentioned, you know, in Chicago. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely a loaded term like social mobile cloud. And because it's used so liberally, I can see why there's concerns about it being a hype. But when we apply it to our field and it becomes transformational, studying cancer, cancer research, we apply it in our cities, we, we use it to make, you know, business is better to leapfrog the competitor to deliver better customer experience then that's when i think it's you know a truly transformational thing in our field and it, it really is something that in the last decade only in the last decade have we uh, truly started to leverage it with all these mobile devices and phones and sensors that can collect information i mean there's things you see out on the nfl and they're doing it on the uniforms and they're learning about the players on the field and using that to make smarter uniforms and, and understand uh, impact and, and different things like that. I mean, that kind of stuff is, is just really cool to see when we're using it in a, a, a positive way to transform those industries. Well, to me, and again, you know, talking from, from medicine, the, the hype, I think, has far outweighed the, the what we practically have achieved and I think that there's a lot of reasons for that uh, we look around at all the other industries and we look at you know the giants of you know Google and and Facebook and we see that um, gosh they seem to be able to harness these in ways that help them deliver better services and, and help their 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 business model help them be able to function better and and it seems almost limitless what can be achieved and we look at where we are and we've got fax machines on the wards and you know when we we don't even have everyone's records when we're doing rounds you know half the people are missing vital information and so you know I, I think that th this possibility is going to only be good, as good as our our commitment to ensuring that we are collecting the data and then organizing the data at our own place, we're creating a data lake that I, you know, should be able to stream in data from the electronic health record, from a lot, from remote monitoring, from wearables, from a, a whole range of different sources. And then as we do uh, uh, whole genome sequencing and, and so forth, and, and then trying to, to, to ensure that there is a breadth of data available so that we can begin to, to learn whether or not as we assemble these immense data sources that we can take advantage of them. And, and also what most people call big data in medicine is still small data because we're not actually taking advantage of the, the, the kind of information about people's lives that may importantly affect their health, but that uh, we have heretofore sort of defined as not part of clinical encounters. We need to, and I'll say it out loud, with permission, because I don't think we should be doing anything behind people's back, but with permission, we should be able to acquire data for the people who are interested in it, it to, to create large-scale databases that stream information about their lives, focus on health, not just disease, and be able to leverage this in ways that help us be more precise in the ways that we make recommendations to people about what might be in their best interest with regard to their health. And so, you know, that's why I believe in medicine, we're still beginning, it's such an exciting time to be in medicine. 
there's so much to do. We, we have so much we can potentially leverage, but we are just at the beginning and need to get to a point where we can uh, actually show that we can deliver on the opportunities that are in front of us. But, but you know, we, we, the hype to achievement ratio is uh, very high right now in medicine. I'm hopeful in the next three to five years that we'll be able to bring that ratio down again. That would be medicine. The other areas have made better progress. I mean, an example to pick up on what Harlan would say, and I don't know how medically oriented the several hundred people that are listening in are, but, you know, if you wanted to check someone's um, blood pressure uh, or monitor or check whether they had abnormal heartbeats, you used to have to wait till they came into the a hospital or saw the doctor and the doctor would check on them for a while. And when I was a medical student, just shortly after Harlan was a medical student 30 years ago, they, um, you know, the idea of 24-hour continuous monitoring was invented. And there'd be this big contraption you would send home with a patient and it would, he or she would wear it and it would monitor their heartbeats for 24 hours. And then they'd come back a week later and deliver the, the, literally the device and you'd look at their heartbeat and you would see, you know, whether they were arrhythmias and so forth. And, um, and the notion of using that to actually test whether your drugs were making a difference, that was even more elaborate because then you had to send the machine back and forth. Well, all of that has totally changed now. It's possible to monitor the response to treatments, whether it's for depression, a cardiac disease, and so forth, using devices and uh, traces, digital traces that patients are otherwise leaving anyway. So you can measure whether how active people are using their iPhones. And this might relate to their response to treatment, as I said, for depression or heart disease or whatever. You can buy attachments, of course, to these devices that uh, collect bespoke uh, outcomes. But even without like, actually measuring someone's heartbeat, just measuring their, their mobility, for instance, you can do a lot better. So I, I think there are still very powerful opportunities to, in medicine specifically to take advantage of some of these ideas and technologies, again, with permission. Uh, of patients. Um, so you've touched on this um, this notion of getting permission, and so that leads me to sort of a larger question around privacy and how we should think about privacy issues and this question of permission uh, in the age of big data that we're entering. I definitely think data security and privacy are more important than ever. We certainly, um, you know, see the issues when databases are breached or they're not locked down or they're not using the most up-to-date technology. I mean, really, you can, I, I like to liken it to a car. You can put all the security you want in a car, but if you don't lock the door, someone's going to open the, the door and steal something. And so we need to make sure we're up on the best security practices. We're using the right technologies. Because I certainly... You know, in my business day to day, I wouldn't want any of our information stolen. I wouldn't want any of my customers' information stolen. And even at a level of parenting, you know, I have kids and we're more connected than ever. We've got Alexa in the home. Um, I want to know that that information uh, is safe, yet I want to be able to use these technologies. I mean, I'm a, a mother of three young girls, uh, seven, six, and two, and there's some cool technology that I'm, I want to use. You know, parenting's hard. <laughs> so if I can use a device, like there's a company called Sproutling, and they made a device that goes around the ankle of your infant, and it monitors their mood. I mean, it used to be you had to either sleep in the room or put on a, video, uh, a sound monitor, and then we got video monitors. Well, this actually uh, monitors whether they can tell you if they're awake, if they're asleep, their breathing, even what mood they're in. They can tell you what position they're in, if this is a typical position that predicts they're about to wake up. There's all these really cool things that we can do with these monitors and technology, but I would be um, terrified or worried as a parent if anyone could get that data or could break into my video camera and see my child sleeping or, heaven forbid, interact with them. And so, yes, I mean, more than ever, we want to make sure we ensure privacy and security uh, without limiting all the cool things that we can do with technology. Yeah, yeah I'll just say that uh, this is something I feel very strongly about. I think that we've we've ceded this area too easily to companies that give us terms and agreement that nobody reads and then basically takes all of our data and does a wide variety of things with it to turn profits without our knowledge. 
And I am hopeful that there will be competition that comes up where people will have greater choice into how their data is used. In medicine, I think it's critically important because a lot of the data, for example, in the healthcare systems through business associate agreements are being transferred, electronic health record data being transferred to third parties who perform services for the healthcare systems, but then are enabled to de-identify data to the extent the data can ever be de-identified and sell it for profit. So while people have trouble getting their records and data, it turns out that actually other companies get a hold of your data all the time through these business associate agreements. I believe that people ought to have more agency over their own data. They ought to have greater opportunity to be able to make choices about their data, and they ought to be able to have their data as an asset that they can use with other people for purposes that are important to them. That's a long way from where we are now. And as medicine starts to emerge into this big data era, I'm hopeful that we can begin to set ground rules and we can enforce federal rights that people have to their own healthcare data. Every, um, every healthcare institution, every what they call covered entity, which includes payers, have an obligation to provide people with the data that they're generating about them. But few have the opportunity to do that. In, in, in my disclosure, just, they talked about Hugo, this, this platform that I've created was intended to empower people so they could get it. Other people, will, I hope, will generate similar kinds of platforms and people have choices. But I think we have to time and time again start saying, where is the with permission part around your data? And then we need to create virtuous ways for people to be able to share data because we want data to be able to be shared, but ways that people can be assured of the security, the purpose, and that they, they agree with it. But I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to get to that, to that point because I think that there's a, a lot of possibility of misuse of data now that we've yielded to just because of convenience rather than to insist upon the fact that we know what's being done with data about us. I mean, I, I think on the, on the with permission issue, I think that we should also be clear minded about what things would require permission and what would not. And I think most people, you know, like I don't really have a problem with the phone company analyzing phone usage of its million customers and drawing patterns of which I am one out of a million people whose phone usage is being used by the phone company. I mean, I wish they would pay me for it. Okay, what would they give me, 10 cents or a buck, you know? But, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have a problem, but I have a really serious problem with them zeroing in on me. And I think there's a sense in which practical anonymity uh, is a, a crucial threshold uh, when we're thinking about the with permission issue. So, you know, there, there are ways in which people are just lost in big data, and so nobody really would care. But it's quite another matter if somehow people, it's not just that, in other words, let me be clear, I'm identifiable in that data, so people know it's Nicholas Christakis in that data, but I might not care that the analyst has access to a million names of people, because the analyst doesn't really care who's making which calls. But if the analyst is actually specifically interested in me, then I have a serious problem, you know, with that. And, and that's a distinct issue from, you know, confidentiality, you know, whether it, or the data has been anonymized uh, or not. So that's, you know, that's, I just would say on the with permission thing, I think we should also distinguish different kinds of activities that would require different levels of permission. I saw one of the questions, and I don't want to redirect necessarily, but I was just reading the questions, and one person asked about specific success stories, and I could give one example if you wanted, or we could keep moving. Yeah, that's, that, that would be great, yeah. Yeah, so one thing we did is, uh, a thing that we did is, is uh, I'll have to cultivate some intuition in the listeners, and this is a very visual field, so I apologize. But uh, So imagine that you have a network of people, and some are on the edge and on the periphery, and some are in the middle. Um, you should have the intuition that the people in the middle with many connections are going to get whatever's spreading in the network earlier. Uh, they'll get germs earlier. You know, popular people will get infections sooner in the course of an epidemic. They'll... Uh, well-connected people, we have the intuition they are getting access to valuable stock tips or other information uh, earlier. So your position in a network has something to do with how soon in the course of a, of a marketing contagion, you know, product adoption or, or a germ epidemic, you uh, acquire uh, whatever it is, that thing. Well, what that means is that if we could identify central people in a network and monitor them, passively using big data techniques, those individuals would be like canaries in a coal mine for epidemics and for product adoptions. 
So what we did was is working, we did several projects in this regard, but one specifically that was big data is we used Twitter data and we were able to, um, to pick people at random, 50,000 people out of several hundred million, and then we were able to use a trick where we went one step away from them and picked another 50,000 who those 50,000 people were following, and that second group of 50,000 now became our canaries in a coal mine, our social sensors, and then we looked at 200 hashtags, and we saw, did the hashtags reach the central people sooner than the random people? And the answer was yes. So with this global sensor set of 50,000 people, we knew what was going to go viral on Twitter on average nine days before anyone else. So we could invent techniques to forecast um, you know, what's going to be popular. And this, this basic idea could be used to forecast all kinds of things, elections, uh, product adoptions. If you're interested in whether your marketing campaigns are working and you want to see our, are people talking about my products, uh, of course, germs, we invented this to study epidemic diseases. Um, so, so that's a specific example of a big data technique. And you can, of course, even do this on a global scale, which is absurd. I mean, literally 10 years ago, that was not possible um, if you wanted. So that's one example in response to one of the questions. Great. Well, I think it would have been good if, uh, from the election perspective, perhaps chatting with Nate Silver a week before <laughs> November 8th. Yes. Um, we have a, a couple more questions uh, that have come in. Um, so I, I understand there's a lot of data now, and it's more natural, and there's faster processing. However, are there any new statistical techniques that have been invented to deal with big data, or is it the same techniques we've had for the past 20 years? And can you provide some examples? Uh, let Ma let Megan go with that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly all, we have a ton of new apps and, and companies are building out algorithms and, and getting smarter about processing the data. They're using newer technologies uh, that allow them to do that, even in the marketing field in the last 10 years. When I think about, you know, we have people that come into our funnel to learn about our product, and if we have 300,000 people coming in a, a month, or even a quarter, how do I know which ones I should put sales in front of and, and which ones I should? Who's actually gonna buy? Who's farthest along? And we have technologies now that, that take in thousands of attributes, quickly assess it and decide and give a score to say, okay, yes, uh, I predict that this person is gonna buy this product, you should talk to them first. So we become more efficient with our sales teams, which are expensive assets, uh, with our marketing team. So certainly, over, the, over time, we're getting smarter about how to process the data with these algorithms. Uh, we have a lot of open source projects out there that are helping uh, folks understand how to deal and parse and, and read from data. We're hiring a lot more data scientists uh, at businesses to understand. You have to, you, you hire, you have to have the data scientists and you have to know the questions to ask. And I think we're just getting smarter and smarter about that. I mean, yeah, I think one of the, oh, go, go ahead, Nicholas. You go, Harlan. I was just going to say one of the in interesting things about this is that there were there are a lot of good ideas that have been around for a long time, like neuronets, that we were unable to fully actualize because of limitations of computational power and limitations of the data sources. And I, I think that what's interesting to me is not only are people developing new and better methods, and, and, and by the way, this big data community is an entirely, for the most part, generous community. I mean, the, you, you look at even the big companies are constantly putting out open source uh, tools that we're able to leverage in, in very useful ways. I mean, we're here at Yale and we're doing work and, you know, when Tensor to Tensor comes out, you know, a week or two ago from Google, I mean, we're, we're avidly taking it up and trying to put it to work and see whether or not it helps us understand things in a better way. They're, this community is exchanging information, but, but like I said, some of this is built on ideas that are, are quite old, but were never, never quite able to be uh, achieved. And it, it, as as you know that you know even the ideas around um, natural language processing that, that it's not some of the, the basic concepts here are not 
so new, but our ability to execute on the ideas has really advanced uh, terrifically over over really a short run. And many of us have are hopeful that this will only continue. Again, in our place, creating this Hadoop server cluster essentially gives us access now, given the way that the database is run, to almost supercomputer capability that you know would have been beyond our reach uh, by budget-wise just even a few years ago, but but now we're, you know, with what we're able to use in terms of both software, mostly the software, and in now what is less expensive hardware, uh, we're able to to do things that would have been unimaginable just a little bit uh, ago. I, I understood that question to be, just to piggyback onto uh, what Megan and Harlan said, I understood that question to be a bit narrower, which had to do specifically with what statistical techniques had been invented or were being challenged. And uh, just speaking for my tiny neck of the woods, which is network analysis, there's some fundamental ideas when you are uh, 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 designing experiments or studying response to treatments, whether it's a marketing interventions or, or policy interventions, something known as this, the stable unit treatment value assumption, or SUDBA, which is completely violated in a network. So when you treat one person, they're connected to all these other people, and they get spillover effects. There are whole... I mean, this is a burgeoning area right now. So this is a very hard problem statistically, mathematically, which is being tackled. And, and other ideas, too. For example, when you have millions of people and you don't want to estimate your models on the full data, or maybe you can't even, there are techniques having to do with something known as sparsification, which is how do you thoughtfully delete data? Uh, how do you get rid of the data, the noise, in a way, in order to make inferences? And this is also a very hot area. Uh, you know, how, what are some tools to um, to course in the data without losing the uh, signal. Um, and also another big topic is missing data. How do you handle missing data? So actually, th there are different ways you go about handling missing data when data is plentiful than when data is scarce. So there are many, many areas in which econometrically and statistically uh, people are innovating. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, for those who are uh, just embarking and thinking about uh, incorporating new data into uh, what they're doing, what are your recommendations for um, how they can learn more about it, come up to speed, and really start contributing? Well, we're at, certainly at MongoDB, we do a lot of work and support a lot of uh, companies and developers that are in this space. Uh, utilizing the mass amount of data in their field. Uh, we have a lot of research online on mongodb.com. If you go and search big data, we have a lot of white papers that have been written about it, how companies are using it. We write up things called Leafs in the Wild, which are very specific case studies. Uh, we've got some around Bosch and what they're doing with um, sensors and Internet of Things. So there's certainly a lot of research we have posted. Uh, obviously, the Internet has a, a ton more. Um, but that's something, you know, to get started. I, I will say like any other field, you need to invest your time to learn because, you know, that this is not um, – increasingly it takes skills to be able to work in an area where things are moving rapidly. It, but recognize this. You're unlikely to have <clears throat> all the skills that are necessary this is entirely a team effort. Uh, in, in the most successful areas, this is a multidisciplinary team that where people are bringing different, different pieces of the puzzle. Everyone's deciding on what the key questions are, but there are people who understand different aspects of this, some of the very technical pieces around the data itself and its analysis, but it's also about the translation of the data in ways that people can understand and that are actionable visualization of the data, the reception and understanding of the data. And so, and this, nowhere is this more critical than in medicine where it, we all need to hold hands and, and work together. So people who are experts in, in the data, in, in computing, in clinical care, and bringing in the patient and public perspective and trying to figure out who the end users are. <clears throat> I think where this succeeds best is where there's an idea of who the end user is and what they're likely to do with the information, and then figure out how you can produce that information in ways that are going to help them. The way it works worse is if you just start with a lot of data and you just, you know, you never really clarify what you're trying to answer and you're just, you know, 
you're, you're starting to drown in, in routines and algorithms, but you're really not ultimately moving in any positive direction that's going to affect the world. So, you know, I, I think somebody wants to get into this, figure out what questions are important to you, figure out what, who's working in these areas, figure out what skills among the breadth of skills, try to familiarize yourself with what each member of a team is doing, even if you're not expert in that, and then, and then try to figure out, you know, who you can join. Because it's not, as far as I can see, it's, it, this is not going to be a, uh, about an, in, an isolated individual. It's going to be about people working together, trying to solve problems together. Um, you had referenced uh, the big data community in a previous uh, response, and I, I'm curious who, who it makes up that community. Can you give me a sense for, um, you know, who people can call on when they're trying to explore this, this concept? It's a secret. We couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're we're stymied because, of course, there is no singular community. It's, right, it's, right. I I think it's people who are intrigued by this, by, by going to what I said in the beginning, by the opportunity that exists. And, and I did really like the way that Nicholas framed this as, you know, in the real world, <clears throat> in the real world, we're generating data now every way, every day that's describing behaviors and helping us understand the way things work in ways that we couldn't before, and we're able to, to test these ideas. Like anything else, you can run, you know, academics, industry, nonprofits. I mean, a whole range of groups are intrigued by this. And I think it, it you know, there's not a single group. Meanwhile, there are a lot of, a lot of smaller communities, and that's so small, but I mean, communities who are focused on one aspect of this large and immense enterprise that, you know, people might be drawn to, but, um, you know, there are machine learning groups, there are artificial intelligence groups, there's groups who are more practically oriented, like people, there are groups in medicine who are trying to figure out where digital health is going to lead. And, you know, there's all sorts of groups that go either very specifically on content or largely on technical issues, but there's not any one place to go. Yeah, I think it's really field dependent. Okay, um, so another question uh, from the attendees. In the area of healthcare, what initiatives are underway to integrate data in hospitals and outside of hospitals, uh, meaning Fitbit, iPhone, Google browsing, et cetera? Um, that, might be, that might be best for me. So let me just say, I think with these application program interfaces that most people are building to large data sets, the capacity to be able, and so these APIs, these essentially pipe, pipes that are basically pulling data from one source, combining it with others, lining up the endpoints and ensuring the integrity and security of the data. The, you know, increasingly people are, are, are cr creating the means by which data can be merged. It actually is relatively routine now to take the wearables, and there's some companies like Validic who have got a whole range of these APIs where they can pull data from wearables. And, you know, I think what you're going to see again is increasingly medicine is going to be in a position where data can be merged from a whole wide variety of sources. This has already happened in a lot of areas. I mean, if you look at your, your app on your phone for weather, that's highly dependent on these APIs, these pipelines, pulling data from a wide variety of sources. And then harmonizing it, organizing it, presenting it to you in ways that you find useful. We've been slow in medicine to be able to find these ways for a wide variety of reasons, and some of them are reasonable concerns about privacy and, and regulatory issues, but increasingly with people's permission and, or under the auspices of the health system on behalf of people, th these data are now becoming increasingly available. And I, I see this, this is just a technical problem that we're overcoming now. The cultural problem of how we actually integrate the data and use it in medicine and how we get away from our routine work that doesn't look so much different than it did in the 1950s in terms of our workflows, you know, it's what's going to be our challenge. How do we actually create a new vision of what medicine can be as an information science and leave an era where, you know, it was based largely on, on just 
our what we thought we understood about pathophysiology and um, and and mechanism of diseases, which oftentimes turned out not to be quite right. Yeah, and one of our, our customers on the insurance side, MetLife, when you used to call in to get support, they had to log into 70 different databases. And uh, getting questions answered took a very long time. And the, the challenge was they had these disparate data sets that they couldn't get one view of the truth. And now with technology out there that allows you to deal with these large data sets and combine different databases, um, they've, they've created something that, that they call the wall, and it looks like Facebook. And now when you call in, I've got all your data from all these different databases in one place, and a customer support rep can quickly answer your question. And they've cut down you know, time on the call, support costs, and some much better experience for their customers. So I think as we continue to evolve these technologies and we can access the data very quickly, uh, the experience is just going to be much better. And I, it's obviously the same in healthcare. There was a question, you know, what ha with access to all this data in real time, what are the expectations on uh, physicians and medical in the medical field and how you respond to care? And I think that we're going to be, you know, we're probably going to save lives. We're going to respond faster. You know, if my if sprout lane and my baby is, has spikes of fever or stops breathing, I'm going to respond and we're going to reduce um, you know, things that are happening in the world that we maybe weren't aware, you know, couldn't get to fast enough. And now we're going to get there, we're going to learn about it, and we're going to respond much faster. I mean, I would pick up this thread just to contribute to the conversation and, and maybe also take it in a slightly different direction for a moment, which picking up on the issues of openness, picking up on the issues of, anal you know, how open is the data of analysis on utility of the data, how is it... Um, Repackaged to serve different, uh, different um, uh, analytic or or business or policy agendas, uh, by highlighting a question that I still struggle with, uh, which and I'm sure that Megan and Harlan do too, which is, you know, where is the balance of power between the data owners and the data analysts? And about ten years ago, I was when I was still at Harvard, I was part of a big conference in which I sort of made the claim that after many years of data being um, uh, sort of not so important and analytic power being very important that I thought the balance was shifting to the data holders, that all these firms that had all these data, that there would be hungry statistician mouths baying for access to the data and the firms, you know, would be, would be holding in the data, not wanting to share it, some of which, of course, has come to pass. But, uh, but I think actually what's happened is I think the pendulum is beginning to swing now. I think there's so much data now and people don't really know what to do with it, that having people capable of, of extracting wisdom from the data, it now is becoming ascendant again. So data is now going back to being a commodity. You know, I thought that data was, you know, we had the 10, at the beginning of the big data revolution, I don't think data was a commodity. Um, but now I think it is beginning a little bit again to be a commodity. And I think that, that um, uh, you know, that the balance of power may be shifting to the, anal uh, the analytic function. But I think it's industry dependent. I think it's problem dependent. I don't think that's a general claim. But I do think it's, it's an issue to think about from a managerial point of view. If you think about the inputs of data and analysis, and then you're trying to produce something, you know, which are the more valuable inputs? And um, you know, how are they cultivated or preserved? Okay. Um, another question, uh, what tools would you recommend to understand better your clients using big data? Are there any open tools to explore and learn? I mean, I'd love to jump in on this one, of course, uh, representing MongoDB. I mean, it, it comes down to a couple things. One, you've got to be able to host all the data. So you need some place to put it, like a database. And then you need to, uh, Nicholas point is, you need to be able to analyze the data. You need to be able to extract information from it and do it very quickly and in real time. So uh, as far as technologies out there, you know, we are a, a NoSQL database that allows you to host a mass amount of data and read and write information very quickly, which a lot of uh, apps and, and things today need that. There's certainly other uh, data out there. We are open source products. Or project, uh, but 
I don't know if there's one, just one big data tool. I think there's lots of tools and it's how you put them together to collect the data and then to be able to process it and uh, create an experience from it or learn from it. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, many companies collect data and share with business partners. What role do you see the federal government playing uh, what role do you see the federal government playing in mining this data? Any thoughts? Well, I, I, I sort of responded to this by saying I thought there are lots of public health applications that the government should probably have access to, but it's a, it's a little bit of an unusual question because the government is churning through all of our data all the time. And, uh, you know, there's probably no bigger data minor than the NSA. But, you know, the, I think the bigger question is what should the government be doing and what should the government be allowed to do and under what auspices and, and then how should that be managed and to what extent can the government help promote the widespread use of societal data for virtuous purposes in ways that both are consonant with the values of people in society, protective of, of individual identities, as Nicholas, I totally agree with him, it's not about the collective use of data, but it's about whether I'm particularly being targeted in a way to understand that, that, that offends us. So I think that we are being confronted with terrific possibilities. I think we need to admit that unintended or intended harm can derive from the use of data about us, uh, around us, even characterizing us inappropriately or, or mischaracterizing us. One of my favorite movies is Gattaca, uh, because it shows the both the potential hazards of, in this case, genetic manipulation, but but expectations about people don't always match the reality of what happens. And so, how does this affect my credit rating, my insurance, my the way I live, what people expect about me? I mean, there's a whole range of things as people start to characterize me that, on one hand, provide me a service because they are customizing their approach to me. On the other hand, pigeonholes me in ways that might limit my exposure to other ideas, to other products, to the way in which I live my life. And so these are things that I think are uh, on a governmental level are worth our society exploring so that we're, we can be assured that we're at least reflecting on the degree to which all of these capabilities are enhancing our lives and our societies and not making things worse. And so, you know, I'm just extending that question to sort of saying, I, I, I think there needs to be continuing conversations about what's happening because it's happening so fast, it, it, there's often not a public dialogue about what, what, in what ways these should be best be deployed. Uh, we have uh, about five more minutes and uh, time for another question. So I'm going to see if we have any more questions coming through. And while we're waiting, um, you know, perhaps uh, Megan or uh, if you have any, was there anything that um, you wished I had asked about or that the attendees had asked about that you were prepared to answer? No, I, I have a question, I think for, Me I have a question for Megan. Go ahead. Yeah. What can we expect from MongoDB in the future? So you guys are trying to redefine the way in which we can use these large databases. When you guys are thinking about R&D, how do you do it? Because, you know, you're trying to respond to consumer demand with regard to the need to manage these large databases. You've, you've done a great job creating this, but what, when you think about five years from now, I mean, what's, what's the plan? Like, how are you continuing to evolve the tools? Yeah, so, I mean, it's an awesome question. We just had our big annual user conference last week, and we launched a new product called MongoDB Stitch. And what it's doing is it's allowing more uh, uh, control to developers to set up access rights to data. And so specific to, like, a healthcare app, um, it lets developers declare rules instead of having to write code. And when I, what I mean by that is it allows them to segment patients so they can read their history, but only write account information. And the doctor can read and write all of the history uh, to the patients that are assigned to her. The nurse can only read 
the vitals and write the vitals and results and the researcher can only see the aggregated information that we want them to see so they don't know the individual uh, or where you know the personal side so it'll, it's kind of the next stage is okay you have all this data you are creating all these apps but if we want to apply it in healthcare and other fields that need more privacy restrictions and who can access what of it we're, we're providing those tools and so we're excited last week to launch stitch uh, because it allows you, it's really a back end of the service, but allows you to set up all these, these different rules. And so I'm very curious to see what developers will do with it, specifically in healthcare. There was, there was one question that I just answered. I don't know, I don't know how much, uh, Kavita, how much, how you want to handle the end of this, but that just came up very quickly. Someone was asking about uh, ethical and moral issues in the use of big data technologies. And I, I would answer that by saying that, like any scientific advance or technology, these are dual use technologies. They can be used for good or evil. You know, you can invent a gun to hunt uh, food or you can use it to kill people. Uh, and you can invent uh, chemicals that are useful for uh, treating cancer or they can be used as, uh, you know, nerve agents. Um, and the same happens with big data. The same tools that can increase uh, civic engagement, you know, make voters turn out to vote or uh, can be used to stop them from voting, or the same tools that you can use to uh, clamp down on fake news and the flow with the online can be used to increase the spread of misinformation, or, or the same tools we invent in my lab, tools that try to create artificial tipping points, that try to create cascades or epidemics of good behavior can also be used to foster epidemics of bad behavior. So I think that is a very important topic um, we, I happen to discuss that in some of our writings. I don't want to promote that right now, but but I, I think that uh, that is a very good question. Great. Well, I think that'll have to be the last word. Um, thank you all so much, uh, Megan Eisenberg, Nicholas Christakis, Harlan Crumholz. This is a great discussion, and I hope uh, useful for uh, those who attended. Um, thank you again, everybody, and. Uh, I, if we have any more questions, I, I'll certainly refer them uh, to these three folks and we'll see what responses we can get back to you. Uh, but, but thank you again. And uh, I, I hope those who attended will uh, attend future webinars that we produce as part of SOM Exchange. So uh, thank you again. Um, have a great Tuesday. Thank you all. It's fun to be together. Thank you.